them up. Okay. Yeah, so it it's preparing to stream now, so it should pop up very soon. Okay, and we are live. Uh, welcome web shadowers. Thank you so much for joining us for today's session. Today we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Juliet Ray, who will be teaching us about colorectal surgery. As always, please remember the Google form will be posted in the chat box as well as the description of this video. Um, as is the case for all the Google forms this semester, um, you now have to get three out of four of the questions correct in order to get credit, as well as provide a valid summary. So Dr. Ray, uh, you can get started whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you, Sophia. And hi guys, I'm so excited to be here and tell you a little bit about general surgery and colorectal surgery, which is my subspecialty. Um, I wanna thank all the Web Shadowers team for having me and all you guys for um, logging in and listening to this presentation. Um, so let's start. Okay, so in terms of a little outline of what we're gonna do today, I'm gonna start by telling you a little bit about me and my journey to get to um, becoming a surgeon. Um, we're gonna play a little game, general surgery, true versus false. Um, then I'm gonna tell you about colorectal surgery. Um, then we're gonna go through a case. And then in closing, again, I'll tell you why I chose surgery and colorectal surgery and hopefully convince all of you that it's a great specialty and very fulfilling. And then we'll have some time for questions. Okay, in terms of my background, so I am a colorectal surgeon at JFK Medical Center, which is in Palm Beach County in Florida. Um, I'm also an affiliated assistant professor for the Department of Medical Education at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine, which is actually where I did my four years of medical school. Um, do we have any UM med students or pre-med students heading to UM on the line? I can't see your responses yet, but hopefully we do. Um, and then I completed five years of general surgery residency um, and two years of clinical research. So that was seven years total of residency at um, also University of Miami Jackson Memorial Hospitals program. Um, and then I did a one year fellowship at NYU um, in New York and I just returned back to South Florida to start practice. So this is actually my first year as an attending. All right, so to start, um, some of you guys may wonder, you know, what is a day in the life of a general surgery resident? What does that look like? And I just wanted to kind of go through a typical day um, for you so you can kind of see what you have in store. So typically, you know, you wake up around 5 a.m., you try to arrive to the hospital by six in the morning, which may seem really early for you guys, but I promise you get used to it. Um, you start off by signing out to the night team. So hearing about all the patients, anything that happened overnight, um, getting a good report from the night team so that you can take care of the patients during the day. Then you pre-round, which means you know, stopping by each patient's room, checking on their vital signs, their exam, and any labs or imaging that they had overnight. Um, then around 6.30 in the morning, usually you meet with your resident team and your attendings to do rounds. Um, then starting at 7.30, that's pretty much when the OR starts. You'll move to your, um, res your, your cases for the day and any floor work that has to be done, depending on what level of resident you are, your responsibilities may vary for that. Um, and then you pretty much continue like that all day until all of that work is done. And then around 5 p.m., you'll move on to afternoon rounds. Um, at 6 p.m., you start the process again by signing out to the night team who will then take over where you left out, keep all the patients safe and deal with any new patients overnight. And then at 7 p.m., that's when the fun starts. You go home, eat dinner, study, work out, do what you got to do um, to get ready for the next day and then repeat. Sophia, I'm still not seeing any questions coming in, but if they do, please let me know. Okay, will do. All right, so um, in terms of other responsibilities that you'll have as a resident and other things that may occur during your day, every day there is usually a, a one, one conference or another. So these can be educational conferences in the, in the uh, uh, form of tumor boards, morbidity and mortality count conferences or grand rounds. So there is a very strong educational component during your training as well in terms of didactics. Um, you'll also have about a four week vacation. Um, some programs do that all at once. Some space it out week by week, some two weeks at a time. Um, you also have a yearly in service exam. Um, this is called the ab site for surgery. And then at the end of your residency training, you take both a written board and an oral board. Um, and that makes you board certified in general surgery. 
in terms of research years, um, that is something that is optional, but it's becoming more common in general surgery. So as you saw in an earlier slide, I did seven years of general surgery residency. Five of those years were clinical, two were research. Um, at my program during those research years, you could also get an advanced degree. So I did a master's of science in public health. Um, some programs do just one year of research, some do none. Most offer it as an option, but because fellowship is so competitive, research is really um, a requirement for general surgery residency. And then after that, most people actually go on to fellowship. My fellowship was one year, but these range from one to three years. So there is um, a significant time period can, you know, for training in general surgery. Um, oh, I see a question here. When do you go to bed if you wake up so early? Well, actually, you know, you kind of get used to it. Um, I typically go to bed around between 10 or 11 and wake up around five or six. It's a little better once you become an attending. All right, so we're gonna play a little game here. Um, so true or false general surgery, we'll take a little poll. So number one, you have to be mean to go into surgery and everyone around you is mean too. You guys heard this before, this is a common misconception. Trying to um, log in, Sophia, to see the questions on the YouTube Live. Are they coming in there? Yeah, were you able to find the video of this live stream on our YouTube page? Um, I'm on the YouTube page, I see web shadowers. Oh wait, here it is, sorry guys, okay. All right, I see. I see. All right, so I see all you guys. You got it. False. That's that's totally false. I mean, there is this misconception that um, you know you're going to be in a very malignant environment, and it really frustrates me because I think that that may have been true, you know, 30 years ago, but now um, you know there is a huge diversity in terms of the applicants and the residents that go into surgery. Um, the faculty tends to be of the mindset that people do better and take better care of patients when they're happy and they're not there to abuse you or treat you poorly. Um, all right, so good work on that one. So next question, um, true or false? You'll have no life as a general surgery resident or attending. All right, well, you guys are getting my point. I'm just being you know, sarcastic, but yes, that's totally false too. Um, as you can see, I got married during residency. So this is me, I was in my first year of research, which was um, my third year of general surgery residency. And those other four people in the picture are my four co-residents. So they all got the night off too, to come to my wedding. And, um, oops, what did I do? Sorry, one second. And I actually had two babies during residency too. So um, you can see the one kind of hidden there on my chest, that baby was my, that was my chief year. So that was Ella, she was born my chief year of general surgery residency about four months before I graduated and went on to fellowship. And then the older baby, Sydney, was born in my second year of research. So they will be uh, two and five next month. So totally able to still have a life. Um, all right, we see some questions. All right, I think we answered all those. All right, perfect. All right, so next question, residency is brutal and no fun. Um, well, yeah, you get that too, obviously false. Um, you have a lot of fun, but you do work hard. I don't wanna minimize it. I think you guys should know, you know what, what you're getting into if surgery is something you're gonna become interested in during medical school. This is us intern year, passed out altogether in the call room. So, you know, you work hard, you're there long hours. It's, um, you know, it's stressful and it's hard, but it is still very fun. And we have a good camaraderie because, you know, you get close to your fellow residents. Um, here's a picture of us in the OR. Um, the two women here, as you can see on the left of the picture, we were both residents and the two on the other side or two of our uh, male attendings were doing a big ruptured aneurysm. So that was a big fun vascular case we did as a resident. So time in and out of the OR and and out of work are fun. Um, and you know, you should see it as a really exciting time of growth. All right, and number four, you should choose surgery if you can't imagine yourself doing anything else. Just looking for your answers here. All right, so this one is true. So I was given this advice and I think a lot of people are in medical school too. Um, you know, surgery is a big commitment. There's a lot of stress and there's a lot of responsibility and you really have to be 
passionate about doing it if it is something you're going to get dedicate your life to and i'll talk about this a little bit later um all right sorry i see a few questions here how long after having your babies did you go back to work and how many hours of work do you do per week so um so for my residency there there are Rules are a little bit flexible depending on the program. So in my residency, you have four weeks of vacation. So I saved those four weeks and then I took two weeks of sick leave. If you do those six weeks, you don't miss any, um, you don't need to make up any time. So you can go right through your training without taking any additional time, which was important to me because I was going straight on to fellowship. So I took six weeks for both. Um, I had C-sections for both and that was enough time for me to recover and, you know, I. I felt like that was okay. I do know people, um, not at my program, but at other programs who took extended time, but then they had to make it up in different ways um, you know, during the transition between years. So something to think about. In terms of hours per week that you work, I see a question about that. There are residency guidelines that are the same for all specialties and it's 80 hours a week. And then I see, how does a colorectal surgeon differ from a gastroenterologist? That's an excellent question. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. So hang tight. All right, and this is our last two are false. So surgeons do and don't think. You guys heard this before. All right, I see some more questions coming in. Okay, so yeah, this is, you know, this one frustrates me the most. Um, this is a mistake, it's not true, it's obviously false. So, um, you know, surgeons, get the privilege of treating patients like a medicine physician, you know, doing all the aspects of the full patient care, but you also get the do part. So you also get to take care of the patient in a different way by physically fixing something. And that was something that attracted me to the field of surgery. And I'll talk more about this later, but I don't want you to have the impression as students that as surgeons, you're just a technician and that you're not really a medicine doctor because you actually have the best of both worlds. And I hope I'll show you that through this presentation. All right, so um, I saw that question about colorectal, how it differs from gastroenterology. So let's talk about that. So colorectal surgery, so what is it? So CRS is the abbreviation for that, and it's a subspecialty of general surgery that focuses on the GI tract from the small intestine all the way down to the anus. So it's a little bit of a misconception because it's called colon and rectal, so you would think that's all you take care of, but it's actually the full GI tract, pretty much everything past the st stomach or what we call the ligament of trites where the duodenum transitions to the small bowel. So the reason it's different from gastroenterology is that you go through a full, you know, five to seven years of general surgery training first, whereas gastroenterology, you do three years of internal medicine and then three years of GI. Um, gastroenterology, from the medical standpoint, you're treating um, both the medical and functional side of things, and you do do procedures, including colonoscopies, endoscopies, um, and sometimes advanced procedures if you have training in that. As a colorectal surgeon, I also do colonoscopies and those kind of things, endoscopic procedures, but more so we're operating um, within the abdomen. So you do need the general surgery training. I hope that answers that question. In terms of conditions that are treated by colorectal, most importantly, colorectal and anal cancers. That's probably one of the most common things treated by colorectal surgeons, diverticular disease, bowel obstructions, which can be caused by things like volvulus or twisting of the bowel, ischemic strictures, adhesions or masses, inflammatory bowel disease. This is also a, a subset um, that is very specialized to colorectal surgery. So Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, um, lots of anal rectal pathologies, hemorrhoids, fissures, fistulas, pilonidal disease, and the management of functional disorders like incontinence, constipation, and pain. All right. So I see some more questions before we move on to the case. So can you describe why you pursued an MSPH and how that helped you as a surgeon? Oh, that's an excellent question. So um, during my research years, we were given the opportunity to do an advanced degree um, over the, that two-year time in addition to our research. So I chose a master's of science in public health for several reasons. One is that I was very research intensive um, during my time and I wanted to learn more about um, you know, statistical methods, how to design studies, um, how to perform ethical studies in terms of clinical research, um, and those kind of things. So it helped me with that. Um, you got, you know, more uh, didactic training on statistics and different um, computer software to analyze those statistics and interpret them correctly. Um, and then also learned a little bit about, you know, hospital administration, healthcare, um, insurance, those kind of things that I think 
an understanding of that can help you become a better doctor and understand the resources that are able to help you uh, treat your patients. So I think if you're given the opportunity to pursue an advanced degree, especially if it won't add time to your training, it's definitely something to consider. And I know no, more and more med schools now are actually offering that dual MD, MPH, or MSPH degree. Um, all right, see some more questions. Can colorectal surgeons treat hernias? Absolutely. As a colorectal surgeon, you must be a board certified general surgeon. So you can do everything general surgeons do plus more, everything colorectal surgeons do, or some people choose just to focus on colorectal and that will depend on what kind of practice you go into. Um, oh my goodness, I love all these questions. Thank you guys. Okay, so what else? Um, why did you not pursue an MD PhD? So, um, so MD PhD is it's actually a longer degree. It it adds more time to your um, training. And I knew that I didn't want to be primarily research focused. I wanted to be primarily clinical clinically focused. So for me, that wasn't the right choice, but I do have a lot of colleagues that pursue that. And that is a very valuable degree, especially if you want to be research intensive in your future career. Um, I see you did your undergrad in neuroscience, did you see yourself specializing in something brain related? That's also a great question. So I definitely knew I had that, you know, science inclination um, and wanted to go to medical school, but I did not know what specialty I wanted to go into. And I actually came in thinking I wanted to do maybe emergency medicine because I really like that, you know, adrenaline kind of rush and, um, and excitement that goes along with, you know, being dealing with an unstable patient. But um, I have actually after every rotation I went through, and I think you guys will see this too, you kind of find things you love and don't like about each specialty and that helps guide your way. Um, and so I was really surprised when I started my surgery rotation, having heard all these you know, bad things about surgery prior to starting, how much I actually enjoyed it. And so it's okay when, that your path deviates and you, you know, change from your, you don't have to know now, you're allowed to change your mind. And even once I was in residency, I changed my mind five times about what fellowship I wanted to do. You know, I started off wanting to be a trauma surgeon, then a birth surgeon, then an endocrine surgeon, and I ended up with colorectal. So definitely allowed to change your mind. And I um, think going into each rotation that you do in medical school with an open mind will help you, um, you know, develop those choices. Um, all right. Favorite. Let's see. Is my partner also a doctor? No, he's actually the opposite. He's a lawyer, um, which, which is good, I think, in terms of balance to, to have some, you know, different opinions there. Um, all right. Do you have to write research papers? You don't have to. I think it's very um, helpful for, for multiple reasons. So in terms of research, it's very important to understand how to interpret evidence-based medicine and apply that to your patients. And if you don't actually participate in research, there's really no way to learn how to interpret and understand it and apply it well. So I do think it's very important if most residencies do have a research requirement, even if they don't have mandatory research years. Um, doing mandatory research years is a really great way to be productive in research. For example, in just two years of research, I was able to publish over 30 papers. And to be honest, I really didn't have to work that hard to do that because I worked with a really good team and we were very collaborative. Um, so I think if you have the opportunity to do those research years, if research is something you're interested in, you can be very productive during that time and make it worth delaying your, you know, graduation a few years. Um, okay, cool. I'm going to hold off on a few of these questions just for now so we can get through the cases and then we'll go, um, we'll, we'll tackle them at the end. All right. So I know this might be a little intimidating because a lot of you guys have not rotated yet, um, you know, in the hospital, but I'm going to take you through it step by step. So this is a typical case we see as colorectal surgeons and even general surgeons. So you're called to the ED or the emergency department to see a 66 year old woman who presents with abdominal pain, the inability to pass gas or stool for the last three days. The physician um, in the ED says that she's unstable and doesn't look good and asks you to come see her immediately. What are you gonna do first? I'll give you a minute to respond to that. So whenever you go evaluate a patient, as I'm sure you've seen in, um, in some of these other presentations, what's the first thing you do? So you gotta get a history, okay? It always starts with a history and physical exam, but most importantly is the history. And I'm not sure if you've seen these mnemonics yet, but basically to help us remember what's important in the history, we use these um, sample history, it's called, and old cards. So these are two mnemonics that can help you remember things. Um, so 
Sample history means we ask about the symptoms, the allergies, medications, past history, last oral intake, and the events that led to their current situation. So that's the sort of a good framework if you're trying to remember what questions to answer, especially when you start going through med school and meeting patients for the first time. Um, more specifically regarding pain, if a patient presents with pain, we use a mnemonic called old carts. And these are questions that help us understand the characteristics of the pain. So the onset, did it you know, start five days ago or did it start all of a sudden today? The location, can they point to where the pain is or is it more diffuse throughout their abdomen? The duration, you know, how long does it last? Does it come and go? Things like that. Characterization, is it sharp and stabbing or cramping or gas pain? Things like that will help you understand the underlying mechanism. Does anything make it better or worse? Those are alleviating and aggravating factors. Does it radiate? That means did it start somewhere and spread somewhere else? For example, if it's right upper quadrant pain that spreads to the back, that cues us into different diagnosis than if it's para umbilical pain that radiates to the right lower quadrant. The temporal pattern, so that relation in time, and the severity. So for severity, you can always use like a one to 10 scale to try to characterize that. All right, perfect. So I see someone wrote in physical exam, palpate abdomen, check vitals, exactly. And um, do you, and then the next question is, do you ever take a few minutes to get to know your patients on a personal level before asking about their history? Yeah, of course. So it's definitely good to establish rapport. That's what you're referring to. Um, but that's really more pertinent in a clinic setting, you know, when you're meeting a patient in the outpatient when everything is stable. If you're called to examine a patient like this who's sick or an extremist or unstable, then you really just want to kind of go to the money. Unfortunately, you've got to figure out what's going on and treat it before it gets worse. All right, so you take your full history, but I left you the, um, you know, the details. And, and remember, this is a patient I had actually just a few weeks ago here. So they tell you the pain is constant, it's worsening, and it's cramping in nature, seven out of 10 in severity. It doesn't radiate anywhere, and they can't identify anything that makes it better or worse. Um, in terms of the other history, the patient takes no medications, has no allergies, and hasn't seen a doctor in years. They never had a colonoscopy or any other surgery. Their last PO or by mouth intake was a sip of water, but they felt so nauseous they had to stop. And they smoked two packs per day. Um, they noticed a 10 pound unintentional weight loss over the past six months. All right, so you get a lot of information there. Again, remember it's important not only to characterize the pain, but ask about all those other aspects of the history that are referred to here in terms of medications, allergies, previous surgeries or procedures, um, and their social history, smoking and those kind of things. All right, so you took a great history. What do you do next? All right, I see some people putting cancer question mark. So yeah, definitely getting concerned about that. But after history, someone had mentioned this before, we're gonna do our exam, right? Physical exam always comes next after history. So in terms of a physical exam, we're always gonna start with the vital signs because the vital signs, they're called vital because they're vital. They tell you a lot of important things. So we look at the temperature. So that temperature is, is normal. The patient doesn't have a fever. The heart rate is 122, so that's high. Um, so we call that tachycardia. The respiratory rate is normal and their blood pressure is normal. Um, we did a full head to toe exam, but I'm focusing on the abdominal exam. So the abdomen is distended or bloated and it's firm, meaning it's hard. Um, they're tender, so when you push, they have pain, but they don't have peritoneal signs. So peritoneal signs, are you guys familiar with that? Some questions coming in. Yeah, examine. Okay, so yeah, when you peritoneal signs basically means that there is something irritating the peritoneal lining. Usually that's blood or a leak of bowel contents or such. Um, and that is a very concerning sign that there could be a perforation or a bleed or something bad. So the patient doesn't have that, but they do have tenderness and firmness that are concerning. Um, and you also don't feel any obvious masses, um, but you do a rectal exam and there is blood on the DRE or rectal exam. All right, so now we have an unstable patient who's tachycardic, who has a concerning abdominal exam and blood on the rectal exam. So I see a lot of you guys saying, yeah, you need to do workup, exactly, get, get blood tests, get imaging. Yeah, perfect. Okay, I like all your, I like all your answers. You're right on track. All right, so what are we gonna do next? Like you guys all said, we need some objective data. So we're gonna order labs and imaging. So again, when you're thinking about meeting a patient for the first time and starting this process, you're gonna start with their history and physical. So 
um, then you're going to move through to your objective data, which is your labs and imaging, okay? So we get some labs, and I'll go through these with you because you may not be familiar with these. So WBC is white blood cells, so that usually measures infection and inflammation, and that's high. It's 18. Your hemoglobin hematocrit are also high, 15 over 40, which is high for a woman. So if you see an elevated white count and an elevated hemoglobin and hematocrit and an elevated BUN and creatinine, which measures our renal function, can you think of anything those three things might go along with? I see some stuff coming in here. CBC with differential. Yep, we want to do that. People want to get a CAT scan. People are talking about infection. Oh, what's a distended abdomen? So that just means your abdomen is bloated. Okay, so basically all these labs are pointing to the fact that the patient is probably dehydrated and has some inflammatory or infectious process going on. The potassium is low, um, which is an electrolyte that we check that can go along with this uh, dehydration. Um, and the LFTs or the liver function tests are normal. And the albumin, which we use as a measure of nutrition preoperatively in surgical patients is also low. And that goes along with the weight loss that you guys had noticed um, as concerning for cancer, which is right early on. All right. So what does this tell you? All right, so we kind of went through that. Yeah, you guys are saying infection, cancer. Oh, sorry, what does H&H &H stand for? That was hemoglobin and hematocrit. So your blood counts. Okay, people are worried about infection parasitic infection. All right, let's keep going. We'll find these answers. Okay, so next steps, like you guys all wanted, a lot of you said we need to do imaging. Um, so we're gonna start with an x-ray. So I know a lot of you probably haven't seen x-rays or read x-rays before, but if I tell you that this is the colon and the black is filled with air, um, you can see the colon coming down here, going down and kind of out the rectum here. If that is the colon, do you notice anything abnormal about this x-ray? I haven't seen any responses about that one yet, but basically the colon is dilated or distended. It's too big. The normal colon you shouldn't see so clearly and wide like this on the x-ray. So something is wrong. And, and really this is all going along with the picture that we found on the exam. So, you know, we have this patient whose belly is big and distended, they can't hold down any food. Um, and, you know, they're having nausea, vomiting and all of this stuff. And so when we see this x-ray, we're now worried um, that something is going on with the GI tract, that there may be an obstruction. Yeah, someone said, is that all gas? That's right, it looks inflamed and swollen. I love it, you guys got it. Kink in the colon, exactly. We call it kink in the colon and obstruction. Perfect, I love it. Okay, you guys got it. Oops, what did I do? Hold on, sorry. One second. All right, sorry, I think we're back up. That work? No? Can you see this now? Okay, so what's your differential diagnosis? So I don't know if you guys have heard of this term, but differential diagnosis is basically giving us a list of all the options of things that this pathology could be. So the main thing I'm thinking is that, like someone mentioned, a kink in the colon or what we call a large bowel obstruction. So we have an obstruction, but we don't know yet what it's caused by. So what could be the possible etiology for this? Um, you guys have all mentioned, so cancer, for sure. You could have a stricture or a narrowing. You could have diverticulitis, which is an inflammatory and infectious process that can cause a stricture or an obstruction also. You can have a volvulus, which is a twist in the bowel that causes obstruction. And we can have inflammatory bowel disease, which also causes inflammation and occasionally obstruction. Um, and that is ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. I'm looking at your things. Yep, you all say something. So you're all on the same page with me. All right. So we need some more information. So now we're getting CAT scans. So um, I put a few images from the CAT scan here, but as you can see kind of where these arrows are pointing, there's a narrowing in the colon. So you see how this part is narrow and this part is more wide and backed up and all filled with stool. That's the large intestine that's being blocked by this kink here or this narrowing. And this is all the small bowel. And 
the small bowel is not dilated. So we know that the, you know, that there, there's a problem actually in the large bowel because the small bowel is not dilated. And it also tells us that the valve or ileocecal valve, the connection between the small bowel and the large bowel is is competent, meaning it works, and this is not able to decompress through the small bowel and out the mouth via vomiting. So therefore, this is becoming an emergency because now we're having what we call a closed loop obstruction, and that is a surgical emergency. Okay, so I see some questions. What causes a volvulus? So a volvulus is twisting of the bowel, and usually that's when the bowel is redundant or meaning like extra long and flimsy, and it can kind of twist on itself and get kinked. All right, so now we have to think about surgery. So what things do we do in surgery? And, and you know, think about when we're planning. So this is kind of why I alluded to the, you know, doing and not thinking. We don't just rush to the OR. There's a lot of medical things we have to do first and a lot of medical considerations we have to make before we jump to the OR. Um, oh, I see that question, what type of scan was that? That was a CT scan, a CAT scan. Okay, so first we have to say, is the patient a surgical candidate? For example, if they are actively having a heart attack right now, they are not at this moment a surgical candidate. We have to control that. If they are, have all kinds of electrolyte abnormalities, they are right now not a surgical candidate. These things have to be stabilized before they go to the operating room. The next thing we have to think about is, is the pathology resectable? Is this something that we can take out? For example, if they have metastatic cancer, or throughout the entire abdomen causing an obstruction, we're not gonna be able to take all of that out. That would be impossible and futile. So maybe they don't need a resection, but they need some sort of diversion or decompression. So when we think about the surgical options, the sigmoid, we can take out the sigmoid colon and do an anastomosis, which means a connection. I'll go through all of these with pictures. We can take out the sigmoid colon or do a sigmoid resection with an anastomosis or a connection, and then divert, which means protect that new connection with an ostomy, which is where, um, I don't know if you've seen a bag to the skin where the bowel comes out to the skin and the stool exits that way as a path of diversion. That can be done to bypass an obstruction or to protect a new connection or anastomosis when we have risk factors for non-healing. Risk factors for non-healing would be things like malnutrition and smoking, both of which this patient has. Or we could do a sigmoid resection, meaning taking out the pathology there with an end ostomy. So that means instead of doing the new connection, we just do an end ostomy, bring out the end of the bowel to the skin, and that can be temporary or permanent, but we don't put the patient at risk of having that new connection. And then we also have to consider, are we gonna do the surgery open or with minimally invasive techniques? So minimally invasive techniques mean laparoscopic or robotic surgery. And in colorectal, we do most of our surgeries through minimally invasive, mostly robotic these days. But in cases of emergency with severe obstruction and dilation of the colon, that makes these techniques unsafe. So this would be an indication for open surgery. All right. Um... Let's see, I see some questions here. What type of imaging is involved with colorectal surgery? So we use all kinds of imaging to work up patients, everything from ultrasounds to x-rays to CAT scans and MRIs. Um, and then I see another question. If you closed, don't the surgeries are making more complex the whole and difficult to close? Um, I'm not sure I understand that one. Maybe you can rephrase that one. All right, we'll keep going. All right, so we also need to think about not just only the surgical considerations, but what are particular considerations in our patient. Um, so smoking history, like I mentioned, this can't be understated because smoking really does affect wound healing and puts the patient at increased risk of infection um, and um, actually hernias, post-op hernias. So smoking is a very important patient-specific consideration. Um, we also wanna look at malnutrition. Um, can anyone think of a way that we assess malnutrition? You guys all mentioned the weight loss, which is a very important one. We look at weight loss, specifically if they've had more than a 10 pound weight loss in six months. Can anyone think of another way to check malnutrition? Uh, I'm not seeing those answers yet, but one of them was that laboratory value I gave you, the albumin. So we can measure certain lab values to look for as a marker or a surrogate for malnutrition. And that's why we get those. 
Um, other patient considerations are the emergency status or the stability of the patient. Um, we always like to do surgery in the elective setting when we can control all these risk factors. But in a patient like this who is tachycardic and very sick, then you know, that's something to consider the um, emergent status of the patient. Um, the dilation of the bowel is also important. Like I mentioned, really dilated bowel may be a contraindication to, um, to doing a minimally invasive approach. And also you have to obviously take into consideration the patient's wishes and the risk benefit of all the different options that you're gonna give them, whether or not they even want to have surgery. All right, so, um, oh good, someone did say albumin there and blood tests, perfect. And reduced appetite, yep, those are good markers of malnutrition. Okay, so let's look at um, a diagram of the large intestine just to refresh our anatomy. So you have, um, if you can see my cursor here, this is the end of the small bowel, which is called the terminal ileum. That enters the cecum, which is part of the ascending colon. Um, this is on the right side of the body. Um, the appendix, which you guys are familiar with, comes off the cecum, that's the appendix there. And then once you get to the ascending colon, it makes this turn of what we call the hepatic flexure. We call it the hepatic flexure because the liver is right here on top. Then we come across the transverse colon because it goes transversely across the abdomen. And then the splenic flexure, which is right uh, under the spleen. Then the descending colon, the sigmoid colon, which is the twisty part. This is the part we saw on the CAT scan image that was narrowed. It was narrowed right here. And then it goes out the rectum and out of the body at the anus. All right. So in terms of the type of colectomies or removal of the colon we do as colorectal surgeons, that depends on where the pathology is. And we also have to consider the blood supply to that region because if we take um, the blood supply but don't take the corresponding colon, then we can get dead bowel and that can lead to other complications. So here you can see um, you know, a diagram if you're doing a right colectomy, a left colectomy, a sigmoid colectomy, or what we call low anterior resection, which also takes the rectum. Here, um, for our patient, this is the surgery we want to perform. We're trying to take out this part of the colon, which currently has a stricture. And like we said, we haven't diagnosed it yet. We don't know exactly what's causing that stricture. But like you mentioned, cancer is at the top of our differential because of the patient's weight loss and other symptoms. All right, so this is kind of a zoomed in view on that sigmoid colon. And what I want to show you here is the blood supply to the colon, which is important. Um, the inferior mesenteric artery comes down and branches off into what we call the left colic artery, which supplies the left part of the colon, and the superior rectal artery, which goes towards the rectum here. And then there's these little sigmoidal branches. The reason it's important to know this anatomy is because when we're concerned about cancer, we take this blood vessel pretty high up here in order to get all the lymph nodes that live along this region. Um, the reason we want to do that sampling of lymph nodes is to identify if there's cancer there and help decrease the spread to other parts of the body. All right, so now we've made the decision considering all those factors that our patient needs to go to surgery. So we've decided on a procedure which we call an open sigmoid colectomy. So open versus minimally invasive. We already mentioned the reasons why we have to do this open. And then just taking the sigmoid because we know that's where the problem is. We're going for the sigmoid. Um, so we're gonna make a lower midline incision which means an incision from the belly button down to the pubic bone. And then after we do all our dissection, we do what we call a high ligation of the inferior mesenteric artery. Um, that's the artery I showed you. And, there, and then we need to identify the ureter, which is the tube that takes the urine from the kidney down to the bladder. And the reason that's important is because it crosses right in that region and you can inadvertently injure it during that procedure. And then we take the mesentery, which is the fat and blood supply um, to the bowel all the way down to the rectum to get our distal margin or the part that we're transecting at least five centimeters away from the pathology, actually distally and proximally. And then we mentioned we wanna get the lymph nodes. This is a really hard question, but does anybody know how many lymph nodes we try to get? While you guys are thinking about that, I see another question. What are the side effects of taking out that part of the colon? So um, taking out a small part of the colon doesn't usually have too many long-term side effects. The colon is involved in absorbing water. Um, so sometimes you have diarrhea, but usually that um, 
evens out over time and it doesn't cause a significant impact on the quality of life to do a segmental colectomy. Um, and then what are the differences, uh, necessary skills between open and MIS surgery? So that's why, you know, residency training is five years of clinical residency and at least a year of fellowship because it takes a lot of time to develop those skills in a lot of cases. Um, you know, I did about a thousand cases in residency and another, you know, 300 or 400 in fellowship. So um, you, you really need that um, extra training and there is a high level of skill set um, to do minimally invasive, both laparoscopic and robotic. Um, okay, so I see some people questioning the nodes now, five, three, four, so you actually need 12 lymph nodes. So you need to get at least 12 to consider it an adequate sample. Okay, so then we're gonna transect our rectum, which is that distal part of the colon, and we're gonna ensure hemostasis or good blood uh, control. We don't want any bleeding. And um, here's a really hard question too. How do you identify the rectum? So you saw that diagram that I showed you before um, where the colon transitions to the rectum. And to identify the rectum, um, we actually look for some anatomic features here. So this picture is kind of sideways, but you have the colon coming down here and you have the rectum coming down here. And what you'll notice is um, these what we call epiploic appendages or little fat pads and tinea coli, which is part of part of the muscle of the colon wall. These things are found in the sigmoid colon, actually all throughout the colon, but not in the rectum. So we look for these anatomic features to help us tell the transition between different parts of the bowel and what we need to remove. All right, so then we transect that um, and we need to determine viability of the bowel that we're leaving because like I mentioned, we're worried about taking that blood supply that we have to take in order to ensure we get all those lymph nodes out. And we do that with something called ICG angiography. And I'll show you that in a minute. And then we're gonna mature or bring up what we call the end colostomy, which was when the end of the bowel comes up to the abdominal wall and the stool will now come into a bag as opposed to out through the anus because we cannot connect that back together due to all those risk factors that we talked about. All right, so here's some pictures, not to scare anybody, but let's say you know we open the belly and we see this huge dilated colon pop out. So that's basically what we were dealing with because the colon was so sick and so dilated that it just sort of burst out of there like that under pressure. And then this is an example of the ICG or the idocyanine green flu uh, fluorescence imaging. As you can see, the green, you give a medication IV and then you use a special lamp um, to check the bowel. And here you see this side lights up green and this side does not light up. And so this is the transition of where the good blood supply is, where the green is present and where it's not. So we would know that we would be able to cut out the dead bowel that we took its blood supply, cut that out here. Um, that's a really another aspect of surgery that I really like is the technology. It's ever changing. There's always new um, toys that really help us perform our job, you know, more carefully and safe and more, and more safe for our patients. So um, that is another reason that, that I love surgery as a specialty. And we can talk more about that at the end. But so this was just something I wanted to highlight that we use this tool to help us tell where we can transect the bowel and ensure that we don't have any complications from ischemia or lack of blood supply. All right, so now we have our specimen out. So this is what our gross specimen looks like. So this is the sigmoid colon. You can kind of see the blood supply here, this vessel here, it's a little um, you know, hidden, um, but this was the stump and all the lymph nodes will live in here. And so that's where our pathologist will help us identify all those lymph nodes, hopefully 12 or more. And then this is what that mass looked like. Um, obviously it looks concerning for cancer and you can see that it was near obstructing within our colon specimen. Um, so the colon cancer that is growing from the inside out, causing that bowel obstruction. Um, oh, does the green section mean it's dead bowel? So yeah, the, it's the opposite. The green is what's showing us the viable bowel. So when we give the um, ICG through the vein and then it circulates through and, and comes and perfuses the bowel. So the green is the part that we keep. Yeah, I see you guys saying green is good. Well, that's a good way to remember it. Perfect. Green is good. I'm going to, I'm going to use that. Thank you. <laughs> all right. So now I'm going to show you what this anatomy looked like because I probably confused you with all these, these terms, but basically, like we said, we have the small bowel leading up into the uh, cecum, the ascending colon, the transverse colon, and the descending colon. Now, after this, normally you'd have your sigmoid colon and your rectum, but we transected the rectum. So the rectum's now stump is staying in there. We took out this part, the sigmoid, and we brought up an ostomy 
um, or this bowel to the skin, and now the stool will come into a bag. And this is protecting the patient. The patient can still eat and have normal bowel movements through that bag, but we did not make a new connection because of all those risk factors we mentioned, the malnutrition, the smoking, all these things that would um, put us at risk of having a leak from that new connection. Therefore, it wouldn't be safe to perform. So this was the safest operation for this patient. All right, so in terms of operative details, you may wonder how long does something like this take? So open surgery is often faster than minimally invasive, and the surgery took about one and a half hours. Our EVL, our estimated blood loss, was 20 mLs. Um, the patient went to the floor. They were stable after the surgery and were able to be transferred to the floor. And so our plan afterwards is IVF or IV fluid. A CLD is clear liquid diet. Ambulation, meaning we want the patient to walk and start moving. Um, IS is something called incentive spirometer, which is a breathing machine. We have the patient do breathing exercises to open the lungs after surgery. And DVT or deep vein thrombosis prophylaxis is very important after surgery to prevent blood clots that can lead to pulmonary embolism. So this is basically our plan for post-operative care. And then next steps is that we have to complete the staging workup and await pathology. So we are now very suspicious. Obviously, this looks like a cancer, but we need our tissue diagnosis and we need to stage the patient so that we can offer them the next steps in treatment. So this is like an example. Actually, this is the exact report for the patient um, that we get back from pathology. And I just wanted to show you so you get an idea of how much information we get out of this and what we look for when we see this. So... Um, Oh, wait, hold on. Someone wrote a question here. When you say you didn't connect, could you elaborate more? Okay, so connection. So when, when now we have two, we've cut out the sick portion of the bowel and we have two ends. And we can either make a new connection or we can bring up the proximal end as an ostomy to the skin. The reason we don't make that new connection is because every time we make a new connection in the bowel, it can leak. So if stool leaks out of the bowel and becomes free in the abdomen, that patient can get sick and septic. And we only wanna make that new connection if we're sure that all the risk factors to prevent leak are present. And in this patient, they weren't. So the biggest things that contribute to leak are things like malnutrition, when there's sick bowel or a mismatch in bowel size, like we had a very dilated proximal bowel and sick bowel, um, or signs of ischemia, like poor blood flow, which can happen when the bowel is very dilated. Um, also just, you know, the general health of the patient, patients who are sick and smokers and things like that, um, those all increase our risk of leak. So that's why we chose not to make a connection in that case. Um, in surgeries that are elective, meaning planned, so for example, if a patient came to the clinic and had a colon cancer and we, you know, we were offering them these options, we always try to make it so that we can reconnect on the first surgery. And the way we do that is to optimize all those risk factors preoperatively. However, you can see that in this particular case, we didn't have the opportunity to do that because the patient came to the ER unstable and needed emergency surgery. Hope that answers that question. All right, so in terms of the pathology report, some things you wanna look for on here is what is this? So that's the histologic type. So it's an adenocarcinoma. It talks about the grade being moderately differentiated and it talks about where the tumor invades. So we're gonna talk about this a little more on a subsequent slide, but it invades through different levels of the bowel and this one invaded through what's called the muscularis propria. And the next thing we wanna look at is, are the margins involved? So the margins means the cut ends, are those involved? Because obviously if those are involved, that means we didn't take out all of the tumor and that wouldn't be very good. So here it says the proximal, the distal and the radial are all uninvolved, so that's great. Um, all these things like lymphovascular invasion, perineural invasion and tumor deposits, those are not identified. Those are also bad prognostic factors. So that's why we look for those. And then we also want to look at the number of lymph nodes. Like I said, we actually got 32 lymph nodes. Um, so we did more than the 12. So that's good. The more, the better. And the number of lymph nodes involved was one out of the 32. So now that gives us a new stage. So this is when people talk about stage of cancer, we use this thing called TNM or tumor node metastasis, and it's reported like this. So the T stage is how deep it invades through the colon here, that's called a T3. The N stage is the amount of nodes involved. And it's not like N1 is one node, N2 is two nodes. I'll show you on the other slide how that corresponds, but this came to an N1. And the METS, it says MX because we haven't fully staged this patient. We don't know if there's metastatic disease elsewhere because we never scanned the full body. So we'll get to that in the next slide. 
Okay, so now I see a question. What happens if the path report comes back as not cancer and will there be a second surgery for connection? Yeah, so even if the path report does come back as cancer, um, there could be a second surgery for connection, um, regardless of what the path comes back as, as long as you have modified or controlled to the best of your ability, all those risk factors and the patient becomes more you know, stable and recovers from all these things for sure. We always try to reconnect the bowel. That's an excellent question. All right. So what's missing from the staging workup? So like I said, in our pathology report, they obviously couldn't comment on the metastatic disease because we don't have evidence of that. So can you guys tell me anything else we need to do to stage this patient? How do we tell if there's cancer, for example, in the chest? Did it spread to the chest? Did it spread anywhere else? All right. Those are coming in, but basically we need more CAT scans. So we already had the CAT scan of the abdomen and pelvis, but we never did the CAT scan of the chest because again, this was an emergency. So in the elective setting, we try to do all of these things, um, you know, pre-op so we can have the full picture, but sometimes unfortunately it doesn't work out that way. So we still need to get the chest scan. We also need to get what's called the CEA, which is a tumor marker. So when we know that it's cancer in advance, we check these tumor markers. And the importance of those is that we follow them over time. And if they, for example, we take the cancer out and then they increase three years later when we're surveilling the patient, that would be concerning for cancer recurrence. So tumor markers are very useful in colon surgery. And we also want to do a colonoscopy because there could be another tumor somewhere else in the colon. We never worked that up. And most colon cancers are identified, you know, preoperatively on colonoscopy. So this doesn't become an issue. But if it's not done preoperatively, it does have to be done before, for example, you reconnect that patient because we want to make sure we're not missing another tumor. All right, so next steps. So we're going to refer to our oncologist. Again, people keep asking why colorectal surgery? This is one of the reasons. I love the multidisciplinary aspect. So as you can see, we've already worked with, you know, GI doctors who may diagnose these cancers on colonoscopy for us. Then we've worked with the anesthesiologists in the OR. We've worked with the medical doctors on the floor who help pre-op and stabilize our patients and the cardiologists who give us cardiology clearance. And now we get to work post-op with the oncologists who are going to help us manage chemotherapy and surveillance for the patients. Um, Nutrition, like we mentioned, this patient was severely malnourished. She had a low albumin and a significant weight loss that so we have to get her tuned up so that she can heal better and hopefully get reconnected in the future. Smoking cessation, absolutely super important. And now um, I wanted to show you, this is a super overwhelming slide and I don't want anyone to get nervous, but um, as you go into med school, I would recommend um, signing up for a membership to what's called the NCCN guidelines. If you just Google that, um, everybody can make a free account and it will be very helpful regardless of what specialty you go into. But these are our national guidelines that help us um, help show us how to stage and treat pretty much every kind of cancer. Um, so when you log in there, you'll see an option for colorectal cancers and you click that and it will go through staging and treatment for each cancer. And it's a very good way to study um, during med school and for your boards and whatever specialty you go into. Um, at some point, you'll have to reference this. So um, these are what we call the, the TNM, as I mentioned, staging guidelines. And you can see that these T stages refer to how deep within the bowel wall the tumor extends. The N stage refers to how many nodes are involved. So N1 is one to three nodes, N2 is four or more nodes. Um, and then the M stage refers to if there's metastatic disease. So for example, if on your CT chest, you saw metastatic disease in the lung, then that would be an M1. Um, all right, so I see some questions here. Um, if you end up connecting, what happens at, um, in that post-surgery and the healing process? So yeah, when you reconnect the bowel, our goal is that those bowel edges are healthy and they heal, um, and then the patient is able to have you know normal bowel movements um, again through their anus, but not you know that doesn't always happen. Sometimes there's complications with that, and you can have a leak, um, a leak of stool into the abdomen, and the patient can get very sick, and that can um, be a devastating complication. So you have to make sure you have optimized all those risk factors first. Um, the next question is: Do the majority of colorectal cancers become metastatic? So. No, actually, most colon cancers are stage one or early stage colon cancers. And that's another reason I love colorectal. I hope you can see all these amazing reasons for the specialty. But um, most colorectal cancers are actually diagnosed early stage and can be treated just with surgery. Most don't actually even need chemotherapy or adjuvant therapy. 
Um, and then the last question is, can you elaborate on tumor markers? So um, yeah, so tumor markers, um, again, they don't, for colon cancer, they don't really have, um, you know, prognostic implications, meaning that if you measure the CEA and it's 100 versus 20, that doesn't really mean too much. What's important is the trend over time. So if the CEA is high and we take out the cancer, it should go down. And then every year, every few months, when we check that CEA, um, in the first year, it's going to be every three months, if it increases at a certain point, that would raise our suspicion that perhaps that cancer has recurred and we would then do a workup to look for that cancer with colonoscopy or with um, further imaging. Um, all right, so I see another question. Do you feel lightheaded or squeamish when you saw surgery in med school? Oh yeah, for sure. Like my family still makes fun of me because I used to pass out if I had to get a shot or anything. Um, I think that's something you can overcome. And um, I hope you've seen through this presentation that surgery is really cool. And I have to say, when you're in the zone, you often don't get that squeamish feeling um, because you're so focused on you know what you're doing. But, um, but you know, it's definitely something that you can overcome if surgery is interesting to you. All right. So we're almost done with this presentation and then I'll go through the rest of the questions. So, um, so again, this was back to the staging. So if you look here, like you said, are most cancers metastatic? No, so metastatic cancer is stage four. And you can see here that's less than 5% of all colon cancers. Most, um, or five-year survival, sorry, for stage four is less than 5%. So if you have stage four, that's, um, you know, not a good prognosis. But if you have stage one, which is the majority of colon cancers, then you have a five-year survival of 95%. So it's excellent prognostic factor and most cancers are detected early. And this is how we turn in that TNM into a stage. So um, basically I know this looks very complicated, but it's simple if you look at the fact that between stage, so stage zero through two are very low grade. Once you have nodes involved, that becomes stage three. And in general, this is when we have to start giving chemotherapy. Again, that's a simplified version. There are some nuances, but you can remember it that way. And then stage four is once you have M or metastatic disease. So although these charts kind of look intimidating, if you really break it down, it's pretty easy. All right. And then the last thing we have to do with our patients is we have to surveil them. So again, this is a slide from the NCCN guidelines just to show you how much incredible information there is um, to help people who are trying to learn about this. But based on the stage, that, that tells us what we need to do. So for stage two to three, which is what our patient is, every three to six months, we do a history and physical, make sure they're doing okay, and we check that tumor marker, the CEA. And then every six months, we do a full CAT scan um, to make sure that that you know, tumor hasn't spread and there's no recurrence or any evidence of disease. Um, and then we also repeat the colonoscopy one year after surgery. All right, so coming towards the end, um, before I take any more questions, um, you know, just a summary, why CRS or why colorectal surgery? So people always ask why I chose colorectal. And colorectal surgeons, again, have advanced training in taking care of patients with a variety of disorders affecting the intestine. And like I mentioned, it's really a misnomer. And it actually kind of frustrates me because we treat more than just the colon and rectum. We treat everything from the small bowel down um, and including a lot of different pathologies like Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, diverticulitis, colon, rectal, and anal cancers, small bowel cancers, appendix cancers, small and large bowel obstructions, and then lots of benign anal rectal problems too. Um, and the coolest thing about this field is the variety. So I think I've probably shown you a little bit in this presentation, we get to use all kinds of cool techniques. So minimally invasive things like the robot, transanal endoscopic approaches. Um, we used evidence-based pathways um, to help our patients recover. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the um, enhanced recovery pathways, but that was actually started with colorectal surgery. So we use a lot of evidence to um, make decisions in how we practice medicine. Um, and we use multidisciplinary approach, like I mentioned. We work with oncologists, GI doctors, interventional radiologists, nutritionists, ostomy nurses, every specialty in medicine we work with. Um, so it's very multidisciplinary and that's very rewarding um, to have that relationship with the colleagues. All right, so here are just some pictures. Um, so this is us doing a robotic surgery. It's um, me with a resident. As you can see in robotic surgery, we use a console um, that's connected to um, instruments that are at the patient's bedside. And we actually control the whole operation through here. So the majority of surgery, at least in my practice of colorectal is done robotically. Um, so that's a picture of that. 
Um, this is us doing another procedure. If you can see this um, device, this is a you know, fluoroscopy. We're doing what's called an interstim placement, which is a sacral neuromodulator that we use to help patients with fecal incontinence. And here's another picture of me just doing open surgery. So as you can see, there is so much variety in colorectal surgery. And in terms of advice I have for future um, physicians, I wanted to leave you with this quote. So my program director, um, Dr. Sleeman in residency always said this to me, he would say, don't be an ostrich. And I never really understood what this meant until I graduated. And basically what it means is don't bury your head in the sand and face your challenges head on. So through your training, I know it seems overwhelming and like a huge, you know, thing to, to get to the point where I am. But I promise you that if you just keep moving forward and don't back away from challenges and don't be frustrated by setbacks, you will get there. So whenever a challenge comes to you, don't bury your head in the sand, just face it. And that happens in medicine too. You know, I think about that a lot when I'm taking care of patients. If I, you know, if something's not going right with the patient, I don't want to bury my head in the sand and pretend it's not there. I want to, you know, recognize it and treat it and address it. So I think this is pretty much good advice in, in whatever stage you are in your medical training. All right. I see some more questions here. So why did you want to be a physician in general? Okay, so physician in general, I mean, everyone has their own reasons for going into medicine. I always found it to be this, you know, noble, like honorable field. I didn't have any physicians in my family. And, um, you know, so I think it was sort of that awe of being able to help people in that intimate way that made me want to become a, a physician. Um, what surgery or procedure has made the most memorable impact on you? Oh my gosh. I mean operating on people is really always memorable. Um, it's a very, you know, intimate relationship you have with your patients. I think it's unique in, you know, compared to any other field of medicine. Um, I would say the most memorable ones are all the cancer cases because you, you know, you have this opportunity to really change someone's life and you go from most of the time having to give them horrible news of a new diagnosis to hopefully excellent news that you were able to resect it and everything went well for the surgery. And now they're, you know, going to be able to overcome that. So, um, yeah, I think any time I interact with a patient with a, you know, a malignant disease, that is most memorable to me. All right. How do you deal with patient deaths? Oh, this is a hard one. You know, that's, that's the thing about surgery is surgery is fraught with complications and you have to actually factor that into your decision making. Is this something you want to do, a field you want to go into because it's high risk and it's high stakes. And so dealing with patient deaths is difficult. It's really challenging. It affects you for a long time. And it's not just deaths, it's complications too. Even, you know, complication that may seem small, like a wound infection or a leak or things like that. Um, they do affect you and it takes a long time to get over. And um, I think the best way to deal with deaths in terms of, um, you know, be dealing with the patient and their family is just being very honest. It's always important to, um, you know, to communicate with the family and to, you know, be sincere and be apologetic. And, um, and then, yeah, as a, on a personal level, it just takes time to get through, but it is an inevitable part, uh, an inevitable part of surgery, because unfortunately that is a complication that happens. Do you prefer robotic to open? And when you were in residency, did you learn more open? So I do prefer robotic to open in certain situations. Um, robotic surgery, it's very nice on the surgeon. It's comfortable. You can see very well. You can do finer movements because you're using very precise instruments. Um, and I think it has an incredible effect on the patient's um, post-operative course. I mean, I did a robotic um, colectomy a few days ago on like an 87-year-old and he went home in three days. I mean, if you do a big open surgery on an 87-year-old, they'll be stuck in the hospital for a long time. So yes, I think robotic surgery is great and I do prefer it. However, there are situations where open surgery is, um, is required and it's important to know when to do what. So that's something that you learn in training. Has COVID affected your work experience? So yeah, I was actually in New York City last year in fellowship um, when COVID started and it definitely affected my training. And I think even to today, it's probably affected my first few months as an attending because, um, you know, elective volume is down. So, so it has um, now, you know, I have had to operate on patients with COVID or, or found out that they've had COVID after. So yeah, it, it has for sure affected me as I'm sure it has affected all of you guys. Um, another question, how did you manage having a family during your residency? So yeah, so having a family is, um, is definitely challenging at any point, whether or not you're in medicine. Um, and, you know, 
I was very lucky because I had a great support system. I had an incredible husband who was very, you know, dedicated to our kids and um, really committed to being super involved. Um, but we also didn't have family nearby who was able to help us. So I did have to have a full-time nanny and that is a huge financial burden. Um, so something to consider, but um, not, you know, it shouldn't uh, keep you from having a family if that's something you're interested in, but it does require some planning and, um, you know, and a focus on timing and resources because you are going to have to consider those things. Um, next question is for general surgery residency. Oh, what does it say? Um, how long were surgeries on average? How do you manage to stand for long hours without losing focus, endurance? Okay, so this is this is kind of a hard question to answer because surgeries can be anywhere from 30 minutes to you know 12 hours. Um, I think that it does take some getting used to. Like I remember being an intern and seeing you know attendings that were in their 60s and 70s have no problem standing for 12 hours, whereas I was like hungry and had to pee and you know was freaking out, um, and I couldn't imagine how that wasn't an issue for them. So I definitely believe that it does take getting used to, but also when you're actively doing the surgery, I mean, time goes by so fast. You're really so focused. You're so um, concerned about every little thing going on in the operating room, going on with your patient. And it's like you become in some zone that I can't really describe if you haven't been you know, there yourself and, did, um, and you really don't think about all of these discomforts. Um, that's pretty much the only way I can describe it. All right, let's see. Could you please speak on the conditions that negatively affect blood flow to the colon. Oh yeah, so things that can affect blood flow to the colon is if the colon twists, for example, gets kinked off or twists, or there's edema, various things that can kink off the blood supply to the colon. Um, so that's one way is, um, is twisting or kinking or obstruction. Um, another way is you could have an embolus, for example, a blood clot that travels to a blood vessel that can kink off the blood supply as well. Um, let's see. What are your thoughts on the surgical field transitioning to robotic surgery instead of open procedures? Oh, so like I mentioned before, I think it's great. It's a huge advantage for the patients in terms of recovery, but again, not all surgeries can be open or can be uh, done robotically. All right, let's see. Oh, tips to increase the steadiness of your hands. So honestly, I, I do think that this is a common thing med students and pre-med students worry about, but I don't think you should, you know, think that this is something that's going to prevent you from becoming a surgeon if you want to. Your, your technical skill is something that you develop over time. And when you're a med student or just learning, you're nervous and you shake and that, you know, really just comes with experience and practice. So I don't think there's really any way to improve that except for just, um, you know, practicing and getting more experience. Um, oh, someone has a question here. What didn't you like about emergency medicine? So I, I actually still love emergency medicine as a field. The, the main reason I didn't go into it is because I didn't like having a long-term relationship with the patients. What I love about colorectal is most of the time you get to see the patient pre-op in the perioperative period while they're in the hospital and then post-op. And then with the cancer patients, you're also doing surveillance on them every few months. So you really get a good relationship with them. And it's so great to see patients come back, you know, give you a hug, tell them, tell you how great they're feeling, how appreciative they are. And that's one disadvantage of um, those more outpatient, uh, you know, encounters that you would have in, in emergency medicine. Um, how do you deal with burnout? Oh, that's a good question. Well, luckily I'm still early in my career, so I haven't had a lot of burnout, um, in, you know, as an attending in residency, um, there were a few times that I did feel burned out, um, you know, on a particularly hard rotation or was when I was working on trauma or on nights. Um, and I think the best way to deal with that is to, um, you know, go to the things you like, look for the support of your family and your friends, do the hobbies you like, working out, running tennis, whatever it is, and try to have that escape in the time that you're outside of the hospital. Um, what is the typical age range for the patients you see? So that's another great thing I love about colorectal. So I only treat adults, so 18 and older, but I, like in one day in clinic, I'll see patients from age 18 to like 98 because, you know, there's, there's people, uh, you know, older patients with cancer, younger patients with inflammatory bowel disease. So there's a really large range. And again, that speaks to the variety of this field, which is also one of the reasons I chose it. Um, Let's see, do you work with PAs in your specialty? Absolutely.
absolutely. Um, when I was in fellowship, we had um, an incredible team of PAs that we worked with both inpatient and outpatient. Um, we had PAs that rounded on the floor to help us manage our patients while we were in the operating room. And then we had patients that we, uh, PAs that we saw, uh, we saw patients within our clinic. Currently in my office now, we have a nurse practitioner, but we're actually hiring a PA as well. Um, next question is, could you tell us about your experience applying to medical school? Any recommendations for pre-med students going through this process? So um, I, when I was in college, I basically knew I wanted to go into medicine. So I tried to um, you know, get involved with as many sort of extracurricular things that I could to boost my application. One thing, I went to Emory um, University for undergrad. We had a volunteer EMS service. So I did all the training for that and I volunteered as an EMT and that was a really valuable experience. I think that's sort of one of the reasons why um, you know, I liked emergency medicine initially because that's what, what I had experience with. And I also used that training to work in an emergency room on the weekends um, as a phlebotomist doing blood draws. So I think having any experience you can um, while you're in undergrad that can expose you to hospitals or other medical professionals or sick patients can really help you because it gives you something to talk about and help you know explain why you're interested in medicine on your interviews. Um, but of course, most importantly, I would say focus on you know your exams, getting good grades, your MCATs, all those things because unfortunately, um, you know th those are the things that matter um, to get you through the door. How often are you on call? So that really depends on your specialty and your practice. So in my practice, we take colorectal specific call, meaning we don't take general surgery call, which for me is a huge advantage. Some other practices you have to take call for both. Um, I wanted to be a colorectal only, so I don't take general surgery call. And I'm one week on every three weeks. Um, so there's three of us and we rotate every three weeks. Um, okay, have you ever had a difficult case where you had no idea what to do and how did you approach it? That is an amazing question. And of course, I literally have that every day. Like I mentioned, I'm in my first year of being an attending. So I just graduated fellowship um, this summer. So yes, there is so much I don't know. And I think that's one of the exciting but also frustrating things about medicine is that every time you learn more, you realize there's more you don't know. So the more you learn things, the more in depth you understand things and then the more you realize you don't know. Um, so the most important thing is really to stay humble and to acknowledge that you don't know something and not to, you know, rush into things. Um, so you really have to, you know, ask for help. And that's the importance of having mentors. And, you know, for me, that has been a very, very valuable experience. Um, and I think, you know, having people who you can trust and rely on and call for for help is, um, is very important. I have my um, Instagram link there. If you go to my Instagram, you'll see um, a link to a story about a mentor, um, Dr. Bana, who I trained with when I was a resident um, at University of Miami. And now we are both in practice together. And I talk about the importance of that mentorship relationship. And I'm very lucky to, to have her because she is someone that I go to when I have questions. But yes, you will always face cases um, you know, where you don't know. But the, the only advice I can give you is to seek help. You know, don't ever rush into a diagnosis or a surgery or treatment without understanding what's going on. And then also, you know, trust yourself. Know that you can work through the steps of approaching that patient like we went through with the um, with the case presentation. Um, do you get weekends off? Do you get enough sleep? So yes, in training, you get um, usually, I mean, it depends, but usually you're on every other weekend. It all, it depends on the program. Um, now as an attending, yes, you know, if I don't have patients in the hospital, then I have that weekend off if I'm not on call. And um, yeah, I do get a lot of sleep, but I also I'm not the type that needs too much sleep. So I'm okay on like, you know, six, seven hours of sleep a night. But yes, you can make your schedule and your career, you know, fit your needs. But in, in training, you know, sometimes it's a little bit less flexible. Um, let's see. I have, oh, where'd that question go? Sorry. Has there been anything that someone told you that might've been negative and made an impact on you? Do you wish you had listened to them less? Yeah, you know, Unfortunately, medical school and, and getting into med school and getting same thing for getting into residence fellowship is is competitive. And the best advice I got for that and I think has really helped me is that, you know, take that negativity as inspiration. Don't let it knock you down. Use it to build you up. You know, when someone says something bad about you or or, you know, tries to hurt you in that way or put you down, it's because of their insecurity. It doesn't have anything to do with you. So use that as motivation just to be better and do better and, and don't ever let it, you know, hold you back. Um, so yeah, if, if, you know, people 
say bad things about me. I try not to listen to it. Um, I, and you know, I just try to grow and be a better person. You know, I wouldn't take any of that seriously and just remember that it, it reflects them and not you. Do you have any tips for taking or preparing the MCAT? Oh my God, you guys, I'm so old. That was so long ago for me. But, um, you know, I did a review course. Um, I think just trying to be organized, making yourself a schedule. Unfortunately, you're going to have to take a test, you know, multiple tests every year of med school. You'll have to take all three step exams. You'll have to take the boards for your um, specialty. And, um, you know, you're going to have to be testing throughout your whole life. And even once you're board certified, you have to recertify. So unfortunately, testing is a reality in medicine. And for me, that's always been a very stressful thing. But I think the main thing is to make a schedule and stay organized. And that will help you, um, you know, make it through when you're super busy. Um, have you ever experienced any bias against you as a woman in this field? So, you know, that's an interesting question. I think there's kind of two ways to look at this. I personally um, don't feel like I have because I don't I don't like let it affect me. There's, you know, there, there's definitely a disproportionate burden, you know, disproportionate population of men in the field of surgery, but it is getting better. Most residencies now are 50% women. And, um, you know, I think that depending on where you are in the country and what program you go to, that really isn't an issue. But whenever there's, you know, a bias against you like that, I think it's good motivation just to work harder and show that you're equal, if not better um, than, than your male colleagues. And especially in colorectal, I've actually found being a woman an advantage now. A lot of times, you know, when I have new patients come to clinic, I ask them, how did you find me? Because I'm fairly new in the area. And they'll say, oh, I was actually particularly looking for a woman colorectal surgeon. So in some ways, although there is a biased against women in certain fields, especially in mine, it's actually helped me. Um, how did you get strong letters of rec from professors? This is a great question. So it is super important to have good letters of recommendation. One thing I would recommend, like anything else in your application is to be very organized and proactive. So I, you know, have to get, I still have to get letters of recommendation. And one thing I often do is that when you email that professor, make it easy for them because it is very difficult and very time consuming to write letters of rec. So what I would do is send them your CV and even send them an outline with like bullet points of key things you want them to mention in your letter of rec. Like for example, strengths and list your bullet points, weaknesses, list your bullet points, goals, list your bullet points, because then when they're writing your letter, it'll be easier for them. They're less likely to put it off because they have it all, you know, spoon fed to them. So I think that's a good strategy. Be organized, give them plenty of time and spoon feed them all the information, you know, a ready to go outline of the letter and even a copy of your CV. So they have all that information at hand. Um, all right, next question. Looking back, is there anything you wish you had known as a med student? Um, you know, that's a hard question. I mean, you always you always wish you wish you knew more. I think um, the one advice that I tell med students I'm working with now is that you should like go through every specialty as if that's what you want to go into, because you never know how your situation might change, how your priorities may change, and you don't wanna burn any bridges. And more importantly, that may be the last time you see that information. Like even, you know, you may be taking care of a patient. Like for example, I did a colectomy on a patient yesterday and we had to call in OBGYN to do a hysterectomy and ovarectomy because it, it ended up also being cancer spread to those organs. So, you know, I wish I had paid more attention when I was on my OBGYN rotation because I hadn't seen that anatomy in a really long time. You know, I hadn't seen that surgery in a long time. So, um, you know, I would just, Go into every rotation with an open mind, learn as much as you can, be like a blank slate and let everyone impart all their knowledge on you because you never know when you're going to need it. All right. Any more questions? Can you talk about your first surgery experience? So I'm trying to remember. So I actually did, um, I, my first surgery rotation was actually trauma, which is pretty terrifying if you're, um, you know, trying to be in the OR for the first time in that, you know, in that situation, because the patients are really sick, everybody's kind of stressed out. Um, I remember it was a gunshot wound patient who was very unstable. They had a gunshot wound to the abdomen. They were bleeding. They were transfusing the patient. And I was sort of just in shock about the whole experience because although I was freaking out, like the every, all, you know, the surgeons and all the nurses and they were hustling, but they were very calm in what they were doing. Like they were very, um, you know, it was like they had done it a million times. And I, that really set this impression on me of like, isn't it amazing to be so confident in something like I will never be like that and I think that kind of like sparked my interest is like surgery being this like idealized like hard challenging thing to to be involved with and like a you know that would that sort of like set this expectation for me and I think it was sort of that um high standard that 
you know, made me want to pursue it. And then when I saw, saw that it could be attainable, that I could actually go into that field, that was, you know, exciting. So yeah, everyone kind of remembers that first feeling of being in the OR because it is, it is overwhelming, but it's also fascinating. Um, Alright, now that you're in this field, um, has the specialty exceeded your expectations? Is there anything in this field or medicine that you would change what you would be? No, I mean, I think um, I'm very lucky that, you know, I chose surgery and I never went back. I'm very happy with what I'm doing. I think it's great to do a fellowship because it does give you advanced training and advanced confidence in a, in a subspecialty, but having that general surgery background also keeps the options open, keeps the doors open. Should I ever want to do, um, you know, incorporate more general surgery into my practice, you know, I'm trained and qualified to do that. So I think, um, you know, that having that flexibility and all those options is really great, but yeah, there's nothing else I'd rather do. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for all the thank yous. Um, it was really nice speaking with you guys. I know we're over time, so I'll let you go. But um, again, feel free to reach out to me. Um, like I mentioned, I just started this Instagram page a few months ago, and I'm really hoping to um, motivate medical students and you know pre-med students to consider surgery and colorectal because I think it's an incredible um, field with so much potential. And, um, you know, I'm sharing interesting facts about colorectal surgery, cool procedures we do, and, you know, also information about various pathologies for patients. So um, thank you again for this opportunity. And please feel free to keep in touch via, via messaging with that. Take care. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Ray. This was a wonderful presentation. Everyone learned so much. Um, for everyone watching, the Google form for attendance has been posted in the chat. And keep an eye out, it'll shortly be posted in the description of this video. You have 30 minutes um, to fill that out, so please make sure you get it done on time. And Dr. Ray, thank you so much once again. This was a great presentation. Awesome. Thank